Welcome to this week's program of Ascend Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burnick. Okay. And today our program is an autism in fiction, translating our experiences on the autism spectrum into fiction. And our guest is Don Levin, the author of three novels and a fourth to be published in September of this year. She has been selected by the California State Library as one of the novelists included in the library's collection of California novelists. And she has taught for more than 20 years years at the UC Berkeley Extension program. But before we get into the program, well, what's with your shirt this time? I'm glad you asked. My first shirt of, of the year is my is my new Houston World Series shirt. It, it was it was given to me by my Uncle Jim and Aunt Pam. It's to celebrate the 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 Astros winning the World Series for the first time. <laughs> we are very excited. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Well, I think we will now begin. Could you uh, begin with the questions, please? Gladly. Tell us about your background as a writer. How long have you been a writer? Well, um, I've been a writer as long as I can remember, if you count the poems about our dog that I wrote in fourth grade. I mean, actually, I just, I always wanted to be a writer. And if you said I started my first attempts very young. Now, in fact, I even wrote a novel when I was in high school. Now, these were very, very bad novels that I did not show to anybody, and I'm glad I did not. But I guess I got really serious about it, wow, uh, um, years ago. <laughs> um, and uh, so it's been, uh, you know, 20 plus years that I've been sitting down on a regular basis with some occasional breaks um, and writing daily as writers, most writers will tell you they must in order to get something done. How is autism involved in your current book? Um, well, this is a story actually, um, I, many years ago I asked myself the question, well I was teaching fiction, let me back up. I was teaching fiction at UC Berkeley Extension and one of the elements of the novel that I would talk about is the element of setting, which sometimes I think people don't appreciate as much as they might. And that's the time and place in which the, no the events of the novel unfold. You notice most sitcoms, could they, they take place in New York, they take place in Seattle, LA, they, San Francisco, they really can take place anywhere. It doesn't mm -hmm. really matter much. Um, a novel, where and when it takes place, is, is crucial because it gives us a context for who the characters are, what they value, uh, what's considered rebellious behavior. If you look at Pride and Prejudice, the fact that you know a woman wants to marry for love instead of go, an arranged marriage, that in itself is is radical. So I was was talking about setting, and I asked class rhetorically, of course, what if Anna Karenina had been born 150 years later in San Francisco? And my answer was, um, well, she would have left the uptight husband and ditched the lover when she got bored with him and moved to Marin and started her own line of sportswear called Anna! Exclamation point. And then a few years went of my telling that fascinating story went by, and then I thought, why don't I write that book? Anna Karenina updated in, you know, in San Francisco. Well, since life isn't that quite that simple, it happened that I, uh, I really wanted to write about a young man, a child really, uh, with autism or on the autism spectrum. And the question is, why would why um, would Anna stay with this boring husband in this day and age? Well, what if they had a, a son on the spectrum, and she might stay for his sake? So that was how I that was how I came to write the book. Those those events just kind of came together. If um, if I if those hadn't come together, something else would have come together. I I just always I've always wanted to write. I've always and I love to make things up. So I might have made something else up, but this is how this particular book came to be. Can I hold it up now? Is this as good a Please time as any? There we go. Yes. Here it is. Yeah, very <laughs> scary. Um, thank you. 
Do you have a new book related to autism being published this year? I do. And um, in September of this year, the same publisher, it's an emerging New York press, Chickadee Prince Books, is going to publish, uh, he could be another Bill Gates, which is about the same characters five years later. Mm. So that the 10-year-old boy in this novel is now um, 15 and in high school, and he falls in love for the first time, and we're still with his mom, who's now a single mom. Oops, spoiler alert. Um, and we, there are other characters as well. He, uh, he now has a sister that he didn't have before. But um, So I hope some people will read the first book and be enough interested that they'll want to read the second. We'll see. Excellent. Could you tell us more about the plot of uh, your current book? The, the plot, well, um, it, I had so many false starts. Um, I, I think I started it five different times, mm -hmm. maybe four, but at least four different times and throughout the first 30, 40 pages, all those times, um, because the opening was just too dull. And uh, believe it or not, the opening I finally created that people didn't think was quite so dull was a field trip on a school field trip, which doesn't sound that fascinating, but um, this is a field trip to a place called Minotaur Island, which mm -hmm. was based on Angel Island. Right. So we, people, uh, and I've been on a school field trip where you hike around the island, and one particularly nightmarish trip where you we had to hike to the top of the island. And I kept saying to the teacher, uh, uh, are we close, are we getting close? And she was like, it's just around the next bend, and we'd go around the next bend, and there'd be another hill to climb. Um, but on this fictional field trip, yeah. some of the boys wander off and and be, and go missing. So that was how it finally uh, began, and then that sets off a series of events that leads to the mom meeting the guy she thinks is her real soulmate, and instead of her boring husband, and mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that's how that came about. I always tell students, don't go back and rewrite. But, but I did. I rewrote that beginning many times before I finally got onto the right, what I hope was the right track. Excellent. Would you say that the characters drove the direction in which you were going or the circumstances of like the setting and so on? Since you had mentioned that you had some preliminary openings that didn't seem to go anywhere and Again, from what I understand, uh, this is diver this is a mystery in some ways, and that Anna Karenina, from my limited literary knowledge, isn't. So, can you tell us a little bit about how you chose the direction that you went? Well, as I since I had the original Anna Karenina as a uh, as inspiration, mm -hmm. that helped a lot. Plotting is very hard for me, and for a lot of writers, for other writers. It's, it's that's just their gift, mm -hmm. and and of course they work hard at it too, um, and they can turn out well plotted books, you know, one yeah. after the other. With me, it was just, you know, agony. Okay, what happened? What does this lead to? What does this lead to? Um, I hope that in the end, it seems cohesive and that there's a smooth link of cause and effect, but in the there was a lot of trial and error in coming to uh, the conclusions that I, I did. And of course, the real challenges of a book are in the middle. A lot of people I work with will say, oh, I've got a good beginning, I've got a good end, but I don't know what to do with the middle. And that's definitely where you're going to lose a lot of readers uh, if you're not careful, if you don't keep accelerating the pace of the book. So, uh, you know, at one point I had index cards and I was mm -hmm. shuffling them and uh, there's this new program called Scrivener that some people mm -hmm. swear by and other people are terrified of and I don't want to miss, you know, Tolstoy didn't need <laughs> Scrivener, so. <laughs> so I figure, uh, you know, I'm, I've got my word processor, I'm okay. A number of our viewers are also uh, creative people mm -hmm. who are aspiring to be writers in some capacity. Could you tell us a bit about your creative process? Um, you know, it's the, it, that's such an elusive um, process.
it's so elusive. And what I've found myself is that, you know, first of all, you get the your best ideas when you're falling asleep at night. So keep a notepad by your bed because you're not going to remember it later. You think you will, but you won't. But then, but most of these ideas come by virtue of derriere on chair. If you <laughs> sit there long enough, then eventually, you know, even Minesweeper gets dull. Mm -hmm. You got to be careful about YouTube. That's a black hole. Um, but the the ideas will come just from just from time and patience and intense prayer and um, the triple shot mocha always helps um, and and a lot of times it's just just get something down just get anything down mm. just write the words um, to every Beatles song you remember I'm dating myself a little here but or every you know um, every nursery rhyme you remember from being a kid and it comes from that usually but uh, but that's where writing daily is really important too mm -hmm. you don't wait till you feel like it because you never feel like right. it you think you're going to feel like it but you never feel like it so it's just me and my chair and my in my case my laptop and my cats <laughs> these are all these are all important elements you know for me well, good to hear now uh, Stacy and Jennifer I understand you have some questions too sure um Okay, so uh, I guess my qu my question is, what other examples of betrayal about autism fiction? Um, well, I think the big, um, the, the popular one, the well-known one is uh, Christopher Boone from Curious Incident, The Dog in the Nighttime. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that was not the first portrayal of a character on the spectrum, but it was such a popular book that it opened the floodgates for many, many other books um, mm -hmm. with characters on the spectrum, either as the narrator or as a secondary character. Um, my observation in, in reading many more is that they're, they're, they lean toward YA novels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the preponderance of them are, are for, aimed at, at teenagers. Mm -hmm. And I... My guess is that they're really aiming at the siblings um, to say, look, these, are, this, these kids are out there. Um, you know, get over yourself. They're going to be your siblings and your kids and your friends. Mm -hmm. um, they also, unfortunately, lean toward the portrayal of the person on the spectrum as savant, mm -hmm. which is actually the exception, of yeah. course, just as it is in the general population. And that Right, I think that will correct itself, but right now it's giving the wider public a some mis misconceptions about people on the spectrum that everybody has some strange gift about with math or memory or mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. an interest in penguins or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But yeah. you know, it, time will will correct that. All right, Donna, I wanted to ask you about the publishing process. Mm. Did you encounter any difficulties in getting your book published? Did you encounter any attitudes of nobody wants to read a book about autism or we already have enough books about autism, nobody wants another one? Uh, no, no, I, I didn't actually, I'm happy to say. Um, I did have people say no, they didn't want to publish it, but they had other reasons. Um, they didn't fall in love with it is a popular one when people turn a book down. Um, the fact is, it's just a very, there are so many books being published, which is good, um, that in order to get someone to publish it for you, you really have to get somebody at the right moment, the right mm -hmm. time to say, oh yeah, this is it, and this is going to be the breakout book, and usually they're wrong. But um, it's like any uh, field of entertainment mm -hmm. uh, that way think but happily um, the public general public's interest in autism is just increasing it's not going away and it should increase and it will increase I think mm -hmm. for a long time to come so uh, I actually have a question to tag along with that um, it sometimes with publishing with publishers does it have to do with more of the writing or marketing or hopefully both um, publishers uh, are very concerned about the marketing. Yeah. And how are we going to shelve this? With, yeah. uh, which has become a little less important in the Amazon era. Uh -huh. um, but uh, 
when when I've I've you know I've been actually hanging around this business mm -hmm. seriously for thirty years, mm -hmm. and thirty years ago obviously there were no Kindles and there was no internet, mm -hmm. and I went to a panel discussion where I heard a panel of writers say they uh, all care, publishers care about is the bottom line. And even back then, I thought, well, they have to care about the bottom line. That's how they stay in business. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Why don't we let the government take this over and see how that goes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, you know, so I, I have no problem with a publisher saying, I can't make a lot of money off this book, and mm -hmm. so I don't want to publish it. Mm -hmm. And happily, we've come into a time where self-publishing is very easy and affordable, mm -hmm. and no writer need worry about uh, what we had to worry about not very long ago, which is mm -hmm. you would labor for 10 years over a book that no one would ever see. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. can very easily get it up on the internet, very cheaply get up on the internet. Mm -hmm. I don't, Amazon doesn't even charge you to publish your Kindle. Oh, wow. Now you have to sell it, and you still have to reach readers, but you know they, that worst nightmare can't happen anymore. Mm -hmm. So oh, it's, okay. it's a good time to be a writer. Along those lines, Anana, um, how, in this era, how would you recommend uh, and how do you yourself reach readers? How do you get the word out? Well, the internet has made it much easier, and yet it's still extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. Of course, um, the really the way to reach readers is to spend a lot of your time trying to reach readers. You blog. You tweet, you have a Facebook page, you're updating it. If you have a website, you have to you have resources on it that encourage people to come back to your website. Mm -hmm. You could spend ninety percent of your time just what they call building your platform, um, and and all of us, all writers, have to decide how much of their time they're going to spend on that. Um, on the one hand, you can't spend too much time. On the other hand, there's still only 24 hours in a day. Mm -hmm. We Even Zuckerberg hasn't figured out how to change that. Mm -hmm. And if you spend all that time marketing, you have no time to write. So you make a decision. I think hopefully that a lot of it, the time and persistence is, is part mm -hmm. of it. Whatever readers didn't get to this book might get to the second book or the fourth book. Then they might go back to the first or second book. And then so... You have to be, for most of us, you have to be in it for the long haul. It's, you always hear about the person who wrote the big breakout book on the first go-round, but those are really yeah. the rare, rare exceptions. What is the theme of most of, your, of most of your books? What I've noticed somewhat recently is that I'm really fascinated with how people delude themselves. Uh, the things that people tell themselves to justify what they do, to explain what they do. Um, to misinterpret what others do. Uh, I've just see, noticed that as a, a pattern that uh, emerges. And it has nothing to do with the spectrum or not the spectrum. We're all human. And um, we, we all do it. Uh, Joan Didion said we tell ourselves stories in order to live. And that's what we do. And I think... Um, I think I just see that cropping up in my when I when I write a lot. Donna, would you encourage uh, members of our community to begin writing? Oh, absolutely! Um, and the more the better. We're just beginning to see the the, the very first lap of the wave of books about the experience of people on the spectrum and and their loved ones and their friends and their family. Um, and you know the saying variously attributed that you've made if you've met one person with autism you've met one person with mm -hmm. autism so we need to hear about the people who are not savants we need to hear about the people on various uh, ends of the spectrum we need to hear about men and women and people of different ethnicities and heritages we um, we need to hear all those stories and more stories the better and we certainly need to break out of the stereotype that people on the spectrum can't tell a story mm -hmm. because they can and they should and we want to hear them. So, very much so. Thank you, Donna. Would you be able to stay with us a little as our book correspondent and our cultural correspondent may have some It would commentary. be very much my pleasure.
We'll now hear from our book correspondent, Jennifer Brooks. Thank you, Keith. Today's book is titled Asperger's and Self-Esteem by an author named Norm Legend, who is a father of a son on the autism spectrum, as a foreword by Dr. Temple Grandin, another famous writer on the autism spectrum. And... He has written a previous book called Diagnosing Jefferson, which involves looking over the details of Jefferson's life. Most of us know that he wrote the Declaration of Independence and he was the third president of the United States. So he was able to achieve a lot. He's what we would call a high achiever, Mr. Jefferson was. However, he also had a few, well, more than a few, characteristics that today might qualify him for a diagnosis of an autism spectrum disorder based on the criteria of the DSM. And Jefferson is not the only one. In addition to Jefferson, he writes about 12 other historical characters who were also high achievers, who also demonstrated many of the traits characteristic of autism. In addition to Jefferson, we have Mr. Albert Einstein, who could not speak until he was about three or four years old, around the same age as Temple Grandin, and went on to revolutionize physics as we know it. The world as we know it today would not exist without Albert Einstein. A lot of our technology would not exist, possibly including the technology that we are using to film this show, and certainly not things like the space shuttle traveling through space. Nobody could have even imagined that in Einstein's time, except in the realm of science fiction. Then there was Mr. Charles Darwin, who came up with the theory of evolution, shook up science as we know it. Then there was Mr. Orson Welles, the director of Citizen Kane, shook up movies as we know it. The book is subtitled Insight and Hope Through Famous Role Models. The reason he wrote the book was to inspire people like his son and let them know that even though you have what some people in our society choose to characterize as a disease or a disorder, you should not let it prevent you from achieving high goals. In fact, it may even help. Thank you, Jennifer. And now our cultural correspondent, Stacy Kennedy, will give us an update of some relevant events in our community. Thank you, Keith. Hello. Um, what I'd like to, sh the first thing I'd like to share, and I'm sort of going to work backwards on the dates, but I think this fit particular event is worth sharing first. Um, uh, there's this inspirational event of the year um, called the well, not, well, yeah, it's called something, but the 10th Annual Power of Possibilities event, um, and it's going to be an event where you can, you're going to have dinner and, and have discussions, and there, the, it'll also be featuring Orlando Bloom, who will be talking about his life with his learning difference and how somehow it made him realize his dreams and how it somehow made him look at it as a way of um, a, 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 a way of you know following his dreams and how it helped him to become who he was. So that will be uh, that is power of possibilities, which is on March 8th at the gate pathway um, in Redwood City. And it's suggested to get your tickets sometime before January 31st or on January 31st because they, they do sell out. But it's supposed to be an incredible event. So you can find out informa more information at gatepath.org. So again, power of possibilities. And the, the Saturday, January 20th, is Autism Advantage in Science at the Arc of San Francisco. And our co-chair, Greg Yates, will be talking about the world, you know, how it would be like, how it would be like today, or how different it is from everything from spacecraft to computers to MRI uh, scanners, cell phones, and the internet. 
I mean, things were totally different back then when the, we didn't have those things. But um, but he'll discuss um, some things about that. And that will again, that is uh, January 20th at the Ark of San Francisco, starting at 10 a.m. And hope to see you there. Yeah. Donna, do you have any uh, resources which you can suggest to our viewers who would be aspiring writers? Um, yes. Um, first of all, I uh, the marketing person in me forces me to mention that there are a lot of good books about writing mm -hmm. out there. Uh, some people swear by uh, Martha Alderson's The Plot Whisperer. And I've said that for many writers, you know, plotting is a big challenge. Um, I have my own books about writing, as a matter of fact, that Writer's Digest books published. Uh, get that novel started and get that novel written, both by Don Levin, Writer's Digest. Um, uh, there's a book called The First Five Pages, which is really about, I, it's a misleading title because it's about many aspects of fiction. It's the author's Noah Lukeman. However, even more than uh, reading books about writing, get with other writers, get into a writing group, and get into a good writing group. At, when you're starting out, you need a group or a class that's facilitated, mm -hmm. not just a peer group. You need somebody in charge. Just trust me on that. And not all classes, groups are created equal. Um, I've had the experience of the good and the bad, and the, in the good one, people don't just give you blind praise, but they every writer's work deserves respect. Yes. And you're going to get respect from everyone in the group, and the leader's going to set the tone for that. And then after the respect, you're going to get some guidance about craft. Um, and if you are... Um, geographically challenged mm -hmm. and don't don't have the privilege of living in our this great city of ours San Francisco and then there are a lot of resources online um, there's a lady uh, who's a, actually took a class from me once Elizabeth Stark was a writing mm -hmm. school online but there are many others um, there's a place called writers on the net which you will find on the net mm -hmm. and that was the first writing school on the net I taught there myself years ago um, and the guy who runs it is wonderful so also so if you're a little shy about getting out there as I certainly was for many years you can you can do this anonymously now and feel very safe so plug in with other people you can't do it on your own that's the, the moral of this thank you again Don Eleven is there any link that our uh, viewers can uh, find for you do you have a website I do it's imaginatively titled www.don11.com came up, up with that out of thin air and that has a link too that will take you to my Facebook page so please come visit me I'm lonely <laughs> <laughs> be very glad to well thank you again uh, this is our show for this week folks I am Keith Halperin I'm Will Burnick Stacy Kennedy Don Eleven, Jennifer mm -hmm. Brooks. And for this week, we are live on the autism spectrum. Until next time, have a great week.